welcome everyone instant hush which is unusual um so thank you for that um i am really really delighted to see you all and i'm also very happy that we've got lots of people who are joining on the live stream um obviously it's still a slightly strange time so i i appreciate the fact that we can offer this sort of hybrid where people who want to come along can do so and then those who prefer to join remotely can also do so it's a formula that we'll probably use going forward actually because i think it suits a lot of people um, big thank you to Orchard, to their specialists who are sorting the live stream for us, and to Lloyd at Regency, who has arranged the, um, the AV for us. That's fantastic. So we've got two really good speakers today. As some of you will know, we do a pre-speaker slot, which is open to a third sector group. Um, and Ellie Jones, the Chief Exec of Liberate, is here to tell you about um, what they'll be doing this year. And then I'm delighted that we've got Matthew Bell who is now part of the Frontier Economics team, but actually is also an architect and strategist on climate change. And we're really delighted to have someone of his cal caliber coming along to chamber. I was thinking on the way here, actually, on a slightly humorous note, I was thinking about all the sort of positive elements of what we're doing today. And then I also thought, gosh, if you, used, if you told someone that you're positive a while ago, they'd have been happy for you. If you tell someone that you're positive now, they'll run a mile. So it's quite an interesting change of use of our language. But um, uh, anyway, today's event is entirely positive in the correct sense. Um, and thank you for all doing your lateral flow tests and for accommodating the requirements. I think it won't be too long before we're back to doing things in a, a more recognizable way. But I'll now hand over to um, Ellie so that she can tell you more about Liberate. Thank you. Happy New Year, everybody. I'm assuming we're still sort of saying that at the moment. So um, I've come here today essentially to hassle you for cash. Um, so when I spoke to Chamber about this event, they just told me to like be honest about why I was coming here. Um, so this is uh, me um, asking you to support the work that Liberate does with cold hard cash, um, because essentially that's how we pay for all of the things that we do. Um, the question that I assume you've probably got in your head is, but what is that work? Um, we know you host Channel Islands Pride, um, and we see you a lot in the media, um, but what is it that Liberate actually does? Um, why is it important? Um, what do we need money for? And why you should donate, raise funds, or sponsor Liberate? So I'm gonna to attempt to tell you all of those things. So who are we um, and what do we do? So for anyone that isn't aware, Liberate are a small but influential charity that formed in Guernsey nearly eight years ago. And um, we've got the aim of including and supporting lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, yes, we can say that these days, um, and questioning community, their family, friends, and workplaces across the bailiwick of Guernsey. Um, we inform and educate the wider community on the discrimination and isolation that LGBTQ people um, can face in the community. And um, when people can empathize with the struggles that others face, um, this creates greater acceptance um, of people who are different from themselves. And this eventually changes hearts and minds. An integral part of our mission is to ensure that LGBTQ people feel that they're valued, included, and supported in our community, and to ensure everyone has a place. Um, and we also provide a voice for them when that's needed. So we work to reform discriminatory policies, laws, um, and, and laws, and we break down societal prejudices and ne negative stigmas, as well as providing support and a sense of community to those um, with questions about their gender, sexuality, or any aspect of LGBTQ life. Um, our overriding aim is that one day we'll all be treated equally, regardless of ability, age, belief, gender, race, or sexual orientation. We're the only charity that campaigns for and supports the LGBTQ community in Guernsey. And um, we do also have a branch in, Guern um, in Jersey as well. As with most charities, our aim is really not to have to exist, um, but we're a long way from that yet. Um, but what does that actually mean and what do we do? The easiest way for me to show you that is to kind of give you some figures. So there's some statistics coming up. Um, these are our figures from 2020 of what we did. It's still January, haven't got around to doing the 2021 ones just yet. So to give you an idea of the work that we do. So in 2020, we had over 7,000 people attend Channel Islands Pride, which due to COVID was the only real life Pride to happen in the whole of Europe. We held 48 separate group meetings through our trans group, our choir, our family group, our youth group, our mind group, our art group, and our book club. 
We delivered over 92 hours of support to 797 contacts through our what we call activities with purpose social groups um, and our support networks. We held 29 community events with over 12,000 people attending those. Our four big events of the year are usually our birthday fundraiser, which is the Love is Love Soiree, which I'm going to tell you a bit more about later. Um, Channel Islands Pride. Um, we have a Halloween event and a New Year's Eve event as well. And we also attend various community events across the island uh, to have a visible presence with the wider community. Um, it, this it sort of makes such a huge difference, especially to young people when they see sort of people represented in communities. We delivered 99 lessons um, across all but one of the Bailiwick secondary schools. And this ensures that the next generation of LGBTQ young people feel included and respected. We help prevent bullying. Um, and this year, we've even helped schools achieve positive Ofsted results for diversity and inclusion. We delivered over 50 hours of community and corporate training, ranging from the children's convener and teachers to medical professionals and trainee nurses who receive no specific LGBTQ training, despite the LGBTQ community having some very specific medical needs due to being LGBTQ. We campaigned for and helped advise the states of Guernsey on five different pieces of work to reform outdated laws, policies and practices and have been working on a very exciting piece of work to help improve the healthcare for our trans community. We gave out 3,000 sets of uh, rainbow uh, laces and wristbands and that were worn across the Channel Islands as part of our Pride in Sport campaign with EY, um, with both Guernsey FC and Guernsey Raiders taking part um, in a bid to reduce um, homophobia and transphobia in sport. We had 52 individual requests for support, um, which we responded to, and we painted one step, a set of rainbow steps um, in the colourful rainbow colours, which really got the community talking. Despite all the work that we do, each year the request for the help and support grows and grows. So why is the work that we do important? So LGBTQ people have been persecuted and discriminated against throughout history, and we're still working through a legacy of secrecy and shame around sexuality and gender identity. I take a guess that the majority of people in this room have not had a single piece of education at school about LGBTQ people. Section 28, 28 would have been in place during or after most people were at school. This forbids schools to talk positively about gay people and it stopped teachers from tackling homophobic bullying. It even banned pro-LGBT books um, and literature from libraries. And this created a legacy of shame and secrecy that some people still carry with them today. The current media rhetoric around trans people uses exactly the same wording which was thrown at gay men in the latter part of the last century. That of being sexually deviant, dangerous in single sex spaces, and being accused of somehow corrupting children or being a danger to the moral of the fabric of society. It was as untrue then as it is now and history will show that. The work we do in both schools and training organisations helps break down the barriers that do still exist. The support groups and events that we host help people feel like they have a place in the world. They often come from home environments that don't accept who they are, but mostly all of us need to see ourselves reflected in our community to feel valued and connected to it. If you are a straight cis, so somebody that isn't trans um, person, you see yourself reflected in every aspect of life all day, every day. And you know that no one will ever judge you or treat you differently because you are straight or cis. You never need to worry if your family or friends or workplace will disown you for those reasons. And you're already surrounded by a community who share those fundamental characteristics with you. And that's reflected in the media that you see, the movies you watched when you were growing up, um, and the music that you listen to. Imagine never or rarely seeing that, and imagine how lonely and isolating that would feel. So how does Liberate benefit businesses? So the biggest change that we've seen in the last year since Liberate was formed is the change in attitudes towards LGBTQ people in the Channel Islands. It's created an influx of LGBTQ people returning to the island, um, to an island that they once thought didn't accept them. People, more people are out and proud about who they are than ever before. The stigma is slowly fading, um, and we have a growing number of, number of young LGBTQ people and um, being able to be themselves and be open in society for the first time ever. If you've ever uh, wondered how many LGBTQ people are in the community, um, the Guernsey Children and Young People Survey from 2019 showed that 
of young people in Guernsey are LGBTQ. That's nearly one in five people. These people will be entering the workplace in the next few years and will be actively looking for companies that show and um, visibly show support for the community that they are part of. There's copious amounts of evidence that show that people bring their best to work and to business only when they can bring their true self to work. All of this maximizes Guernsey's human capital and aids in the recruitment of high quality candidates. And the more businesses promoting Guernsey as an LGBTQ friendly place, increases Guernsey's appeal in an increasingly competitive global market. We have lots of people from across the globe that contact um, Liberate throughout the year, asking how welcoming a place it is to come and live. So why does Liberate need your money? Um, we have a very professional team behind Liberate who work incredibly hard to make everything we do um, and make, make sure that everything we do is done to a very high standard. Whether that's the training we deliver in schools and businesses and states departments, the work we do on reforming laws with the government, the support groups we host or the events that we put on. Um, as a quick example, we even got a specific mention and were rated excellent in the Elizabeth College Ofsted report this week for the LGBTQ work that we do in schools. Um, and a professional team with running costs and professional resources costs money. Our average running costs are just under £100,000 a year, um, especially in a pride year. Um, this includes staffing costs for essential coordinating of our volunteers and supporting education, individuals and society. Websites, counselling, events, pride, all cost money, um, as does compliance and ensuring resources are spent wisely. We have lots of projects that we hope to get off the ground over the next couple of years. We, of course, have Channel Islands Pride 2022, which will be a huge pan-island celebration of diversity and inclusion, and we'll be celebrating 50 years since the first Pride protests happened across the UK. We have a new autism group that we're going to get off the ground with Autism Guernsey. There's a huge crossover between the LGBTQ community and people who are neurodivergent. We'll shortly be launching a survey of needs for the over 65 population to see what work we need to do with that section of our community. We have an LGBTQ business network that we're looking to launch, an anti-bullying project that we'd like to do in schools, as well as HIV education and support projects. And we're hoping to start a community cafe. So just a few small things that we're looking at. All of these projects take, uh, take financial resources. And although we have a large, amazing pool of volunteers, um, we rely on grants um, from charitable foundations to pay for this work, more specifically the staffing for this work. All charities need to become less reliant on grants as they're not guaranteed. And it's a scary process to go through every year or two, not knowing if your charity is gonna have continued funding. However, we know that businesses don't like funding salaries and running costs as they're hard to quantify. In the charity sector, we always refer to it as the minibus effect. I could have a fleet of corporately sponsored minibuses in a heartbeat, but most charities don't need that to run. They need their running costs, resources and staff to be paid for. They need continuity of funding um, so that they can continue to run. Um, they just need to get on with the important work that they do. We'd love to be your charity of the year. We'd love for you to do a fundraising event for us. Enter your team in um, a corporate team in our unicorn races. If you've not heard about them, I'll tell you about them. <laughs> um, or even donate the funds from a Mufti day. Um, if you did that once a year and every business did that in this room and online, it would go a long way. Um, every penny we can raise helps us become more self-sufficient. Um, but if you do need something to hang your hat on, then please come and speak to me about one of the many projects that I've mentioned. Lastly, but not least, I'd like to invite everybody here uh, to join us at the St. Pierre Park Hotel on the 12th of February to celebrate our eighth birthday. We hold an annual fundraiser called the Love is Love Soiree. And this year, the theme is the Moulin Rouge. And um, we have the wonderful Miss Ivy Page, who was the star of the BBC's The Voice coming along to perform. And um, we have a few early bird tickets left at 49 pounds, includes a three course meal and lots of slightly outrageous um, entertainment. Um, and we'd love to see you there. So tickets are available to book at liberate.gg forward slash book. Um, and finally, if you'd like to get involved with sponsorship for Pride um, or any of the other projects that I've mentioned, please come and find me um, and speak to me here or after this event, or you can email me at ellie at liberate.gg. Thank you.
Thanks, Ellie. That was awesome. I wasn't planning to get back up, but actually I just want to say a big thank you and to um, now hand over to Matthew and our amazing AV wizard, Jonathan, is just swapping over laptops. Give me one second. Thank you very much. That's the smoothest technological uh, transfer I've, I've ever witnessed. So that's great. And, uh, and a, a pleasure to be here. Happy New Year as well to, uh, to everybody. And uh, good to see so many people live and uh, live in both senses, live in person and live, and live online to, uh, to talk a little bit about, uh, about climate and, uh, and climate change today. Uh, just by way of a bit of background about me before we launch into the into the detailed debate, I've been working for, I guess, over 20 years now um, between government and the private sector, doing a lot of work with governments around the world, setting up policies, understanding the costs and benefits of policies. I'm an economist by, by background. Um, and similarly with the private sector, with companies trying to think about what their, what their strategies should be and how to, uh, how to, consider, how to consider the future. And over the course of those 20 years, uh, probably at least 15 of them or so, going backwards and forwards uh, between the UK and, uh, and Guernsey, working a lot uh, with the government here, with the states on a whole range of issues from, uh, from skill strategies to population to airports to, uh, to climate that we're here to, uh, to here to talk today about. And in fact, I guess the the longest interruption in those uh, in those visits uh, over here was through uh, through the last eighteen months, couple of years with uh, with COVID, and so I'm glad to be able to things have uh, have freed up a little bit, uh, a little bit to allow uh, allow more travel backwards and forwards, and it's good to it's good to be here. In fact, in fact, actually, the, the longest interruption in uh, in that sort of ongoing discussion and uh, and debate with with Guernsey was from 2014 to 2017, when during that period I was chief executive of the UK Committee on Climate Change. The UK Committee on Climate Change, as, as some of you all know, is the the independent, the public sector body, but independent from from government, reports to Parliament and is responsible for advising Parliament on all issues linked to climate, climate change uh, in the UK and indeed links between the UK and, uh, and overseas as well. And so I spent three, four years there going through the process of uh, fixing the targets for the UK at the time it was leading up to, to the Paris Agreement, which set the, the global ambition, as many of you all know, to. Uh, to keep temperatures well below two degrees Celsius and try to uh, avoid 1.5 degree rises, leading up to that Paris process and the, and the sets of strategies and uh, plans and implementation measures that the government put in place following on, following on from Paris. So that was a, a, a good time to be involved in the, uh, in the political debate, shall we say, in the formulation of the formulation of policy. And then I've come back uh, to Frontier Economics uh, after leaving that post, or that Frontier beforehand, uh, to work more with the private sector because you know that is where lots of the action is going to is going to take place. And indeed, uh, the last twenty years, I've had the benefit of seeing Frontier was probably ten people or so in in 1999 when we set it up. Now grown up to sort of 400 or so people spread across offices all around Europe and can hopefully empathize with the position that many of you are in as well, in terms of trying to manage small businesses, grow those businesses into something that, uh, that have, a, have a broader reach. And trying in the course of that to integrate climate issues, which may not be the sort of number one issue on, uh, on the agenda of, of growing businesses and developing businesses, but integrate climate into how, uh, how businesses develop and to the shift and the focus. Um, as I said, I think that will be, you know, moving away in the future will be the where real traction takes place and where we're seeing real changes, real changes happen on the business side of things as business consider how they're going to participate and feed into uh, into the into the climate issues. 
So I want to I want to return to that um, at the end and think about how we move from a global objective around climate to individual specific uh, business actions and things that everybody can think about. But first, I thought I would <clears throat> start with uh, start with the big picture and uh, and what's happening at that uh, global and indeed national level. And so we see here uh, various versions of this chart. I'm sorry you've, you've seen different versions of it, but uh, rising emissions uh, globally, rapidly rising uh, since the sort of po in the post-World post -World War II era from, from 1950 onwards, as countries have grown, economies have grown, and that's been very linked to growth in energy demand and growth in, uh, in fossil fuel uh, sources of that, uh, of that energy demand. But uh, apart from the, the sort of obvious rapid growth that is, is visible in that, in that chart, the other thing that I think is, is important to note is that if you remove any one country from the chart, you still see huge growth and rapid growth. I mean, even sort of now, you know, China is the biggest, uh, the biggest emitter globally, probably only about a third or so of that, uh, of that chart, you can see them there. If you took them out, then they would, you would still see large increases in emissions. And the Chinese government could turn around and say, well, you know, whatever we do, it doesn't really matter. Emissions are still, are still growing globally. You can move, remove the US from that chart, US probably about a sixth or so, <clears throat> and they could say the same thing. You can remove the EU from that chart, and the EU is probably about a tenth or so, and they could say, and the EU could say the same thing. And certainly you could remove Guernsey from the chart, and, and Guernsey could say the same thing. We're too small, it doesn't matter, it makes, it makes no difference. Um, and indeed, I've been following uh, a little exchange in the Guernsey Press and the letters over the last few days on, on pretty much this topic. And I think, the, I think the important point to realize about climate change is that arguments over whether you're too small or too big to make a difference are complete red herring, because everybody's too small by themselves to make a difference. And even China, and certainly Guernsey. And the whole point of all the discussions that we have about climate change, the whole reason for the international gatherings that happen and everybody complains about the difficulties of getting everybody together and obviously the climate costs of getting everybody together. But the whole point of all the discussions that happen is that everybody has to look everybody else in the eye and say, we will do this together. And you will do something and I will do something and our neighbors will do something and one country will do something and one business will do something and another business will do something. And if that doesn't happen, then we'll end up in a world where we do have temperature rises above two degrees and we do face very significant costs and very significant uh, difficulties for large portions of the population here and elsewhere and elsewhere in the world. And so we end up in one of two worlds. Either we end up in that world where temperatures are rising inexorably and, uh, and nobody is doing anything, or we end up in a world where literally everybody is doing their bit and their part and, uh, and we manage to control one of the, one of the biggest threats to, to humankind. And, and that, is the point of, that is the point of that chart, is that everybody is small in the face of this, and we all have to act to, together and, uh, and collectively in our, own, in our own ways. And in some ways, the, you know, obviously the discussions are trying to, uh, are trying to get us there, um, but the failure to do that so far is then, you can see the, uh, the rise in emissions, so the, the counterpoint to the, to the rises we saw in the previous chart, the concentration of of CO2 in the atmosphere rising, rising very quickly, this on a, a much longer time scale. So the rises are squeezed at the, at the right end of, of that chart. And we've got concentrations of, uh, of carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere that we haven't witnessed for 800,000, even more, even more years uh, than that. To put that kind of in a, in a bit of historical context, which is important, um, sort of modern humans, coming in and around you know 50 to 100,000 years ago so that first sort of penultimate bar on the on the chart agriculture human settlements about 12 12,000 years ago and none of that so through the whole course of of human history we've lived in a relatively stable climate we've lived with relatively stable co2 concentrations relatively stable temperatures up and down a little bit um, and we're entering unprecedented, unprecedented times. And as we know, the consequence of that is that we have developed all of our infrastructure, all of our cities, many of the world's big cities for obvious reasons, sitting on either the sea or on, on major rivers, all of uh, how we have developed civilization 
based on a relatively stable climate and a relatively stable sea level, a relatively stable precipitation, a relatively stable and predictable storms. All of those things exist and have happened, um, but through, through relative stability. And the consequences of what we're doing now will be to disrupt that and will cause considerable costs to businesses and to people and to governments and to populations. And the degree to which we can limit it will be the factor that determines how costly, how difficult, and how many lives and other things are at risk as a, as a consequence. Just to, uh, to then sort of conclude the, uh, the, the chain of logic, the rising then CO2 concentrations leading to rising temperatures. Um, and, uh, and all of the hottest years, you know, in the last 10 years and 20 years have occurred in the last 10 years and last 20 years uh, on record. And, uh, and those increasing temperatures obviously underline the agreements that I was talking about before and the efforts globally to keep temperature rises well below two degrees. We're already last year up at about 1.1 degrees above uh, pre-industrial levels, uh, levels of temperatures and trying to keep them below 1.5 degrees above, uh, above pre-industrial levels. So that's the, that's the sort of, that's the global picture and what we're trying to, uh, trying to accomplish through a whole range of uh, agreements globally and, uh, and actions and investments and decisions that are being made. If we then look at the, the picture in Guernsey, the latest sort of statistics, a little bit, uh, a little bit to be updated, but the latest ones uh, on the chart there, you can see Guernsey's emissions <clears throat> and the breakdown of those emissions between energy, sort of power generation, transport, industrial processes, commercial uses and businesses, agricultural waste, and, uh, and F gases, sort of gases used in refrigeration and air conditioning and things right at the, right at the top. And definitely the, the biggest determinant, you can see the big drop uh, in emissions there in 2000 when, uh, when Guernsey sort of started importing its, uh, lots of its electricity from, uh, through cables from overseas. And basically the fluctuation since then is more or less determined by how much power is being generated on island versus off island. There's been years where more power is being generated on island, emissions go up, and in years where relatively less, it, uh, it goes down. Um, and so, you know, clearly that clearly that's a big focus. But then the counterpoint to that is if that's what's creating lots of the variability, then lots of the other sectors, whether it's commercial sector or waste or agriculture, are relatively stable over that period. And clearly what needs to what needs to happen is those emissions need to start coming down in order for uh, in order for uh, Guernsey's emissions to start falling in a more in a more systematic way rather than uh, rather than sort of riding through a bit of a cyclical a cyclical pattern. And so where do businesses sit in that uh, in that process and uh, thanks very much to the to the chamber and to Rolo de Sos Mares there's a, a survey out recently that I've been looking at which uh, which gives some of the information about what uh, what uh, businesses have been thinking and how businesses are, are want to help in that in that process and to integrate them into the strategy. So to the question, how important is environmental sustainability to uh, to your business? We get probably eighty percent or so of of businesses in Guernsey, at least of the one hundred and sixty or so that responded to the survey. Um, saying that it's somewhat very important to them and into how they're thinking about uh, sustainability in the context of their businesses. And so an indication that, that businesses possibly want to, uh, want to help. Or do they, to a, slightly, to a slightly different question about the organization business having plans in place to reduce environmental impact, a lower proportion of businesses having concrete plans in place to reduce, uh, reduce environmental impacts. Only 18% or so having plans in place that have been published and that somebody could uh, reasonably go to and have a look at and, uh, and monitor and compare and think about. Another 20% or so with, with plans in place, but that are, that are private, so it's a step. Um, and a 40% or so that have plans in place of an informal, of an informal nature, which may not I guess in some cases go beyond the aspirations that uh, that were indicated in the answer to the previous question about wanting to uh, wanting to make a difference. And businesses certainly have want to make a difference. They also feel that government should be doing more, um, perhaps on, on lots of uh, lots of issues, but certainly on uh, on this one. And so, do you think that Guernsey's government is doing enough? 
almost half of businesses saying that no, the government itself is not doing enough and, and more needs to be in place on, uh, at, the, at the level of the government. In some cases, maybe to support the businesses or maybe in some cases just to indicate a direction of travel the businesses can, uh, can follow. And there is a real opportunity for, uh, for business in this, in this space. So at an aggregate level, and uh, this is for the UK as a whole, um, what we've seen at a UK level is that since, uh, since 1990, GDP has grown, obviously COVID dip at the end there, but GDP has grown by over 60, 70% uh, since 1990, whilst emissions have fallen by over 40, 45% um, at an aggregate UK level. And so the UK has started the process of illustrating, and in fact, one of the few countries in the world that has been able to illustrate the ability to disconnect economic growth to a certain degree from the growth in emissions. And going back to the charts that we were looking at, looking at earlier, that growth in emissions globally being driven by the fact that as economies grow, historically match pretty much one for one with growth in energy demand. And again, historically, that growth in energy demand linked very much to the growth in fossil fuel energy demand. And the change that we're trying to make uh, in the course of all these climate discussions is to allow economies to grow, to allow businesses to grow. It will result in energy demand growth, but separating that energy demand growth from fossil fuel-based energy demand growth. And that is what the UK is starting to illustrate has been possible. And indeed, you do see it elsewhere, uh, elsewhere as well. And the opportunity for businesses to grow and develop, but not to, uh, not to have the associated greenhouse gas emissions. And businesses are starting then to put in place the plans to realize those opportunities. And you know, taking very much uh, random examples, um, but examples that are public and that businesses can look to in order to try to understand what's happening. You know, Aviva is one of the more prominent insurance companies on, the, uh, on climate change and thinking through its climate change strategies, its plans for how it's going to get to net zero by, uh, by 2040 setting out both, uh, both the ambition at the level of the plan, but also some more detailed uh, pathways below that high level ambition about how it's going to not just set a long-term target, but set intermediate targets by which you can judge whether progress is being made over the, over the course of the period to the 2040 ultimate objective, and being clear about how much of that comes from its own operations, from its interaction with customers and from what customers are doing. Not just having a plan in place, but having a way of monitoring that, uh, that plan also in place. And so you see firms and investors like BlackRock and others being clear about not just what they're doing, but how are they going to put the monitoring in place such that the firms that they invest in um, are accountable for the commitments that are being made because they see it as in their interest in terms of the, the investment decisions that they're making, the, where the demand will be in the future, where the growth will be in the future, that companies are positioning themselves and they're able to monitor that companies are positioning themselves well in that, uh, in that space. And alongside the plan and the monitoring, the willingness to experiment because we don't know all the answers by any means. We don't know exactly what will work either from a technological point of view or indeed from a customer demand point of view. And so lots of experimentation, you know, illustration here of carbon capture, utilization and storage, is that technology going to take off? Will it help with capturing uh, the CO2 that's created in electricity generation, in manufacturing processes? We're experimenting, we're trying it out, we're trying to figure out how to, how to do it. On the electric vehicle side, a lot of experimentation and trials happen so far, costs coming down, but a lot of experimentation with how will people use the charging infrastructure, how will people use their cars, where do we put it best, what's the most way, the way of making it most convenient, of overcoming people's range anxiety, of making it convenient to use, and trying out different uh, strategies for customers. With recycling, waste uh, handling, composting, again, lots of interaction to figure out what's the way of making this easy for people to do um, and, uh, and, accessible to, and accessible to everybody. And so a big part of what's going on is trying out different things and businesses being able to gauge the response of their customers to different types of products and to react to those, to those types of, uh, to those changes as they, as they see them. 
and so maybe that brings us back a little bit to, um, to where I was at, at the beginning and to uh, the shift in my focus a little bit from having worked in the public sector, having worked uh, running the Committee on Climate Change and developed the big national strategies, the big national monitoring frameworks, the big uh, the pathways that we need to follow both at a global level and at a national level, and now thinking about how are businesses going to integrate that into their processes with all the pressures and everything else that goes with, uh, with running a business. And starting with trying to be clear about articulating what the plan is as part of articulating the plan, the range of people that have to be consulted, clearly customers always at the forefront, but employees and an increasing part of um, the businesses the, that I was mentioning and others, you talk to some of the fossil fuel companies, the BPs, the Shells, the others of the world, and they say, the way we attract our best people is being clear about the future and where we're moving to in the future, because the best new employees and the best people graduating from universities want to work in businesses that are, that are serious about the future and where they're gonna position themselves with respect to climate and climate issues. So employees, customers, owners, obviously regulators, government, involving those and figuring out what does that mean for the plan? What can we commit to by 2025, by 2030, 40, and 2050? What to target? What balance of different greenhouse gases? Um, we haven't, I haven't spoken that much yet about risks and adaptation, but clearly that's an important part. Whatever, whatever we do on the mitigation, on the emissions reduction side, um, a lot of changes are already in train, as you would have seen from the emissions to date. Um, and so what part of the plan is about how, how we adapt to risks and adaptation and wider environmental concerns, biodiversity and other things that touch on, that touch on this agenda. And then how do we get there? What's the pathway? How fast can we proceed if we're setting targets for 2030 or 2040? What are the immediate consequences for the next few years? What are the direct levers that we can pull? And what influence, and maybe that's in response to the poll, uh, the survey, you know, what is it that businesses request of government, that government can do, and what is it that we do ourselves as businesses and can, and can move forward with? And then how do we monitor progress? How do we know whether that plan is being is achieved and is being achieved, uh, achieved sensibly and at the right pace? Um, if it's going to be a monitoring that is done privately and internally to the company, which may be very appropriate in some instances, then, then who is the person that's gonna be heard within that company? What are the reporting structures? Who reports to the board? Is it a board responsibility? How do you make sure that there's an honest discussion internally in a company rather than, rather than one that pushes stuff under the carpet and, uh, and ticks certain boxes, but doesn't really, make, doesn't really make progress? How do you set that up in practice within, within a company? Um, and, and or if there's gonna be some external monitoring, who does that? How do you make sure that's done impartially? And how do you make sure they're heard? And it's not just a question of a presentation at a board meeting, but something, and certainly I find a lot, I go to a lot of board meetings and I have a lot of discussions, but at the end of the day, I then leave the room. And how do you make sure that, uh, that the board has heard those messages and takes, them, and takes them seriously? And in doing the monitoring, what are the specific metrics that we're looking at? How do we define those metrics? How do we make sure that they're the right, the right types of metrics and how does, how does everything get reported? And then having the plan and the monitoring is all great, but you need, you need obviously the answer. You need the solutions that are specific to your business. And so where, where do you start across the range of areas? Most businesses will, have, will, have, will be the source of emissions. The source of emissions will come from a wide range of different things. Uh, their electricity demand, their heating demand, transport, waste. Where do you start? What types of solutions work in different areas? How much can you proceed in parallel across multiple areas or in sequence? And how do you experiment? How do you, uh, how do you try different things out? How do you learn lessons from other similar businesses here or, or elsewhere? Um, what analysis can be done and what skills and capacity do you need internally to do that? So bringing that together in a way that then results in a strategy that is compatible with the business objectives of whatever it is you're selling and whatever it is you're trying to, to accomplish as a business. And, uh, and talking to lots of businesses from small to sort of big multinationals, um, that, that process and that way of going through it is, is similar. And uh, you might put more, more or less resource behind it. You might feel that the levers are more or less directly in your control, depending on the size of the business. 
for thinking through that systematically and being honest about uh, about progress is uh, is central to how we are all collectively then going to be able to look each other in the eye and know that each one of us is doing what's necessary to uh, to avoid what could be huge disruption, huge costs, and huge damage at a both personal, economic, and human level to the global economy if we don't get emissions and climate under control. Thank you very much. We're going to do questions. So that's right, yeah. So um, um, thank you very much to Matthew for, for that amazing presentation, talking about the imperatives of having to act right now as businesses and global citizens. Um, a really thought-provoking presentation. So presumably we have a few questions. So let's see some hands and then Matthew, if you point to who you want to talk to, then a microphone will, will hustle its way over there. Magically appear. The first hand I saw was over there on the right. Yes, no, my, my natural inclination is to pace up and down as well, but then nobody online actually hears what I'm saying. So I've been stuck to my uh, stuck on it. I'll, I'll do it this way. Um, it's interesting to note that the UK has managed to reduce emissions by the 40%. Are there any great muscle moves that they did in order to, to get that reduction? And then what are the lessons that businesses in Guernsey could learn from that reduction? Yeah, no, excellent, excellent question. Um, so the, the, the UK, um, by and large, and I'll circle back to the by and large, but by and large, the UK started out with a, quite a sequential approach to how it was going to tackle emissions. They said, we're going to start with the electricity sector because so much of the economy depends on the electricity sector. And if we can decarbonize that, that ripples through everywhere else. And then we're going to follow on with transport and industry and, uh, and home heating and sort of in, in sequence. Um, and so the vast ma the majority of that uh, of that reduction has come from decarbonizing electricity over the course of the last 20 years. Um, huge reductions you now up um, within all of our kind of all of our lifetimes. We were, you know, we, the UK electricity generation was something like, you know, 800 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. And people used to look at that impossible to get that down to 600 or to 500. How are we ever going to do this? Um, and we're now hitting levels of about 100 grams per kilowatt hour of electricity. That's a huge changes as a consequence of developing offshore wind, as a consequence of developing solar, as a consequence of, of, re of reducing the growth in demand through more efficient products that we're using, more efficient light bulbs, more efficient uh, fridges, freezers, everything. Um, and that's been, that's been a big part of, of the journey. And one of the lessons from that is that um, the, the, what's been accomplished so far, and still a little way to go, what has been accomplished so far has really been not from doing a single thing, but doing a range of different things. And so, so yes, we've used uh, legislative, regulatory, and legal levers to phase out coal generation, for example, to get a pathway by which by the end of next year, there'll be no more coal generation in the UK, so figuring out how to do that. But we've also used levers around innovation to subsidize and put R&D effort into offshore wind and onshore wind indeed, um, to bring the cost down of those generation technologies. And we've also used a range of behavioral measures to get people to switch the types of electricity suppliers that they're using and the source of energy that they're using. And so we've used a whole range of different levers to, uh, to move the electricity generation system from one that was hugely carbon intensive to one that is much less and ultimately will be will be nearly nearly zero carbon intensive. The other sector actually in the at the UK level that's done particularly well is waste. And so emissions from waste are down nearly 80% um, from a 1990 baseline. And again, it's been that combination of partly using kind of government regulatory levers. We put you know landfill tax that creates incentives to divert waste that was going to landfill instead to being to be recycled and reused. We've used some regulatory levers to make sure that when you're doing big construction projects and you're knocking down buildings, that the glass goes to recycling and the bricks go to recycling, things like that. But also, as, as you'll all be aware, you know, lots of local initiatives, lots of local education, lots of local uh, behavioral change about what individual households and individuals do in terms of recycling, preventing waste in the first place, recycling the waste that, that happens uh, where, it's, where it's needed. 
and that's seen huge progress over the last 20, 20, 30 years. And so probably so far, a lot of that reduction that you saw is coming from electricity and electricity and waste, some of it from, from industry and manufacturing, some of which at a UK level because industry and manufacturing has, has moved overseas. Um, we've done a lot of work to, uh, to understand why it's moved overseas and it's always important not to conflate the two things. So it's moved overseas for a whole range of um, global trade and, uh, and labor market and local tax issues um, rather than environmental reasons. Um, but that's contributed a bit as well to the, uh, to the reduction that we've seen at a UK level. Um, and you get into this debate, which I won't get into now, but the difference between what are called consumption and production emissions, if we want to get into, we can talk about it separately. And so the, the sort of measurement of emissions and the degree of decrease at a UK level looks slightly different depending on how you measure it, um, which takes account of some of that, how much is because we've moved activity offshore versus how much we're doing onshore. Um, but the majority, as I said, of emissions reduction is, is, not, about, is not about that at a UK level. Um, and so those types of areas, but returning to what I was saying before, when I say um, sort of by and large, the UK has adopted this sequential approach. The consequence of what's happened in the last decade or so, and the drive now very clearly that the UK has adopted as a legal requirement to hit net zero by, uh, by 2050, is that we can no longer adopt this sequential approach. We now need to move much more in parallel. And so we now having sort of the electricity sector gone quite far, we now need to make sure that transport, that heating, that the rest of, uh, of waste, um, that agriculture, all of those in parallel that they start to reduce their emissions. And particularly when it comes to transport and, uh, and heating, emissions have been pretty flat over the, last, uh, over the last 15 to 20 years. And the questions and the actions that are being taken now are really to try to curve those, to turn those curves downwards and make sure that transport emissions uh, emissions from home heating, emissions from agriculture start to really trend downwards in the same way as we've seen in power and waste over, over the previous period. Right in front of me. Yes, I mean, Guernsey hasn't got huge factories, but we probably have a high per capita use of motor cars and a high per capita use of uh, fast ferries and planes. So we've got specific problems here. But my question is, you raised a very interesting nuance. So we haven't talked about much on Guernsey, although we have expert regulators, uh, Dr. Sloan and, and Mr. Lenay and other and Rollo here. But one area that we haven't thought about is you suggest that environmentally aware businesses, sustainable businesses, businesses that are finding solutions will attract and retain better, higher caliber staff and employees. It, so how can we as an island ensure the businesses and the voluntary sector as well are actually offering jobs to people who want to work in a new way? Yeah, no, I, I buy it. and I do think, you know, certainly the, the businesses that I, that I talk to um, in a very competitive labor market, um, whether that's financial services where you're, you know, so you want sort of the, the best and the brightest people to come to do what are very sophisticated, uh, sophisticated sets of work, um, or, you know, engineering type businesses, um, or indeed big retail, big retail businesses, everybody in some sense, competing for uh, for really good employees. And, and we absolutely know that people who are both going into university now and graduating from university, um, high on their list of who they will choose is the, is the credibility of what the businesses are saying about their, their ambitions around, around climate. And indeed, I was looking at one, one study the other day that was saying that, um, that whereas discussions used to be solely basically about salary, you know, how much are you going to pay me? And I will go to the business that's willing to pay me the most. Um, increasingly, that's no longer a differentiator for businesses. And the two things people are asking about, one is around um, uh, kind of working from home and hybrid working and being able to choose where you work, basically. 
Um, and the other is about climate and environmental policies more generally, as these are the reasons why I would choose one company over, over another company as much as you know, one company or, or um, offering me slightly more or less than, uh, than another. So I do, think, I do think that's important. And it's very specific to each business. So it's hard for me to say what, what each individual business can offer, um, but it's very specific to each business. Um, and then the other thing, the flip side of that, attracting good people, being able to pay them, being able to offer them good working conditions, obviously depends on being profitable, being able to grow and being able to develop. And, and certainly um, what, what I see repeatedly um, in, a, in a UK context and certainly in a, in a Guernsey context where you are, you're in a relatively high cost of doing business jurisdiction, you're not going to differentiate yourself in terms of your customers based on being a low cost producer of whatever the output is that whatever the output is that you're producing. Um, and I have these conversations, you know, in a, in a different context, but with steel companies in, in the UK, you know, as an analogy, you know, there, there is no way that a British steel company is going to compete on a commoditized steel basis with steel companies producing steel in Turkey or in China or elsewhere and, and importing it. The way in which you're going to compete is to differentiate yourself. And the one way in which you differentiate yourself is by saying, we produce low carbon steel. Yes, it's a bit more expensive, but all of you companies out there who are building factories and who are building cars and who are building distribution centers and need steel, but have also made your commitments to achieving environmental outcomes, will want to be able to demonstrate that the steel you're using is low carbon steel. And there's a market out there and the growth out there is in that market. And, and I think there's a similar analogy in lots of businesses. You know, we know, you know, again, we spend lots of time with, uh, with supermarkets and retailers, and we know that yes, there's lots of money and lots of profit to be made continuing to sell, to sell meat. And I would be the last person to sort of discourage that. But where the growth is right now is in non-meat products. And if you want to be growing as a business, you might be able to establish and maintain some kind of baseline. But when you look at meat demand amongst 18 to 24 year olds, it's not growing, it's falling. And if you want to grow your business, that's where you that's where the growth and the new opportunities are going to come from. And it will be different for every business. But I think I think the point is you, you you're on a, you're by and large on a hiding to nothing in a in a high cost jurisdiction if you try to compete on cost. It's the question is where are you going to differentiate yourself and where are you going to attract new customers? Question on my left up at the back. I was watching, uh, it was the slide you put up about the, the bar chart about the GHG emissions for Guernsey from 1990, whatever. And you make the point that the UK managed to reduce it from 1990 by 40%. And obviously, you look at the energy uh, contribution, energy generation contribution for Guernsey. The big drop was importing nuclear power. You take out that and you go back to 1990. Sorry, I was just scribbling around in my hand. And the actual everything else change for our emissions is static. In fact, there's been no change over that 30 year period. Now, the UK has agreed it managed to do 40%. We legislated for that. So actually, we, do, we followed the UK and legislated, made it statutory, and we're doing the same with the next round. Um, what do you say to that in terms of uh, do you think people are? Um, have got their uh, their mind set correctly, or do you reckon they will truly appreciate the task that is actually involved? Because in actual fact, other than import energy from uh, France, we've done the square root of zero over 30 years. Yeah, well, given given the experience of the English cricket team so far, I'm going to avoid the googlies. <laughs> and, uh, um, I, I think I think the, the, the important thing, and definitely one of the lessons from both the business side and, and, the, and the government side, is in a way not to be, um, not to be daunted by, by, the, by the challenge and, and to think, you know, what are the first steps that, that we can make? And it is very much combining the creation of, um, of some external pressure on yourselves to, to do something, and that is, in a UK context, very much what the Committee on Climate Change um, did, what lots of NGOs do, clearly, alongside that, um, is create a kind of a monitoring framework that you personally feel accountable to, 
And however you do that in your business or in your circumstances, how do you, how do you create that framework that you feel accountable to? And then, because you feel that sense of accountability, and sometimes your customers will create it, you know, or the fear of your customers going away will create that. Um, however, you, however you do that, then thinking about what are the practical measures I can take on a, on a day-to-day basis through either how I procure the inputs that I use to my business, through how I develop and design the products and the services that I'm gonna be using in the future, through what investment decisions, through who do I hire, um, all of those decisions which you can make uh, as a business, that, it, that, it's a, that it's a feature of those. And, uh, and trying in that sense to incrementally, and that is the only way, you know, what's happened uh, in lots of sectors at a UK level, it feels like in some sectors a big step, but it has happened incrementally and it's happened because you've combined lots of different aspects to how you come, how you come to the solution. I can see you want to follow up. I don't know where the microphone is. Yeah. 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 Do you think that we're probably getting carried away with the propaganda and carried away with the rhetoric? It all looks a bit easy peasy, quite frankly, but actually it's not. And do you think that the scale of what is required uh, is underappreciated on this island? I, th- I think... Um, so, I, so I don't know about the scale of what's required, but, but definitely what it's the consciousness of what of what's required and so what you know you get you know the 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 big drop as you say in 2000 was you know almost was basically by accident i think right i mean you know it was useful to diversify the source of electricity supply and having a diverse source of electricity supply was deliberate but the fact that emissions dropped as a consequence was by accident and definitely we will not achieve kind of 40 percent cuts or net zero ultimately cuts um by accident and so what and so the sort of the, the need to incorporate it into deliberate decision making and conscious decision making is an effort. Um, and, and it will require difficult choices and I don't want to sort of underplay the choices, but I think that once it becomes a core part of the explicit deliberative process, then I think solutions do follow. So then I don't think it's sort of this impossibly difficult thing to do, but it, but it does, re- does need to be inserted as part of the, the conscious part in companies as well as in government of the deliberate process of making of discussions. I don't know if we have to wind up, I can see. Uh, I've been told that we have to wind up there, but um, I think what these questions show is there is huge appetite to understand more and understand how we can act and and to act as quickly as possible. Because I think the last um, 18 months has really um, brought into sharp focus to many people that the time to act is right now and perhaps there aren't enough plans in place and we need more plans and um, I think um, there's there's been some excellent uh, tips and tricks as well on one of those slides about how one moves forward so I'd like to say a massive thank you to, to uh, Matthew Bell for coming over and to Seamus Bringham over so thank you very much.